I would like to go to the bar that I assume we have in this secret cave. The Obsidian Covenant, being a secretive and powerful organization, indeed has its own internal lounge area where members can relax, converse, and share a drink. It's less of a traditional bar and more of an opulent lounge, complete with dark plush furnishings and dim, ambient lighting, perfect for shadowy dealings and whispered conversations. Rare and potent brews from all corners of the realm can be found here, and it's a popular spot for members to congregate after completing missions or during downtime. I would like to walk up to the lounge area and look to see if Vesper is in there. You saunter into the lounge area, scanning the room. The various members of the Covenant are engaged in hushed conversations, some trading stories of their recent missions, while others share rumors and news. Toward the back, in a corner booth that affords her a clear view of the entrance, you spot Vesper. She's locked in a conversation with a fellow member. Noticing your entrance and gaze, she pauses in her conversation and raises an eyebrow, signaling for you to approach. It's clear that she's been expecting you, or, at the very least, is not surprised by your arrival. I give her an enthusiastic wave and shout, Vespa! Hey Vespa! It's me! Henry! And I continue waving and drawing the attention of everyone in the lounge until she beckons me over, if she's even going to. Vesper's eyes narrow slightly at your enthusiastic greeting. The conversations in the lounge momentarily stall as all eyes turn to you and the spectacle you're creating. There's a mix of amusement, annoyance, and surprise on the faces of the Covenant members. After a moment, Vesper lets out a slight sigh and waves you over with a gesture that's a mix of indulgence and exasperation. She says in a voice that's soft, but carries throughout the lounge, It's been a while. Come, join me. She then resumes her conversation with her companion, but you can tell her attention is now divided between the two of you. I make my way over to her table, greeting everyone as I walk past. Hey, Greg! Hey, Tom! Bill! There he is! Dylan in the house! And I'm totally making up names for everyone as I walk past. When I finally make it to the booth that Vesper is in, I dramatically flop into the chair and say loud enough for everyone to hear, Wow! Isn't it crazy how no one introduces themselves in this place? You'd think no one here likes me or takes me seriously. What I'm trying to do is annoy anyone in the lounge who has a problem with me in the hopes that they might try and attack me so I can put on a show of force. And I rolled a 6 on my performance roll. Your attempt at creating a scene definitely doesn't go unnoticed. The dramatic way in which you flop into the chair and the comments about the names draw a mix of reactions. Some members give you amused looks, thinking you're just being the goofy Henry they remember. Others, however, are visibly annoyed, rolling their eyes and muttering under their breaths. Unfortunately, due to your less than stellar performance role, the intended irritation comes off more as clumsiness than an intentional goad. No one seems ready to get up and challenge you directly, but you do earn some sighs, huffs, and eye rolls. Vesper raises an eyebrow and sips her drink, clearly amused. Always the entertainer, aren't you? How was your adventure? She inquires, her eyes glinting with mischief. Her companion, however, seems less entertained and simply regards you with a stoic, calculating gaze. Oh, the adventure. I say with a raised eyebrow and a smirk insinuating that there might be a double entendre that she accidentally implied, and I wait for her reaction. Vesper chuckles, leaning back slightly, and crossing her arms. Ah, you always find a way to twist words, don't you? She grins and takes another sip of her drink. Fine, how was your mission? Find anything interesting. Her eyes dart quickly to your possession, hinting that she already might know or suspect something about your endeavors with the heart of the abyss. I look at her original conversation partner and say to Vesper, It was interesting and say no more while continuing to stare pointedly at her original guest, subtly trying to convey that I won't say much in mixed company. I got an 18 on my performance check. I'm really good at being passive-aggressive. The man, realizing he has become the object of your attention, shifts uncomfortably in his seat. His eyes dart between you and Vesper. It's clear from his expression that he understands he might be the cause of this tension. Vesper, reading the situation perfectly, places a hand on the man's arm. Gareth, I believe you wanted to meet with someone from the Alchemical Division. Why don't you head there? I'll catch up with you later. Gareth nods, though he looks a bit displeased at being dismissed. Of course, Vesper. Until later, he stands, offering you a curt nod, and leaves the booth. Once he's out of earshot, Vesper turns her full attention back to you. All right, Henry. What's on your mind? Her demeanor shifts, now more focused and curious about what you might share. I watch as he leaves. He seems nice, understanding even. Let's hope he won't be upset about missing out on the fight to come. At this point, I turn my attention back to Vespa. So, every time I come back here, some people seem to have issues with me. I want to fight them to basically have them back off and stop trying to cause me trouble. Are you in? And I rolled a 13 on my persuasion check. Vesper leans back, her eyes thoughtful. Every organization has its fair share of internal politics. While I don't particularly revel in the idea of pointless conflict, I understand the need to establish oneself and maintain respect. If it'll ensure that people won't bother you unnecessarily in the future, then yes, I'll have your back. She takes a sip from her drink, eyes still fixed on you. Just remember, it's not always about proving strength. Sometimes, it's about playing the game. I give her a quick wink to let her know that what's coming is part of the plan, and I slam my hand down on the table to draw everybody's attention, get up and loudly state, 
Oh really? You're gonna question my abilities in a fight? I bet I can take on anyone in this bar. At this point, I would like to point at one of the people that didn't seem happy with my entrance. Even her! The lounge goes silent for a moment, with everyone pausing their conversations to turn their attention to you. The person you pointed at, a tall, elven woman with sharp features and dark tattoos running along her arms, narrows her eyes. She rises slowly from her seat, her chair scraping back loudly in the silence. She looks you up and down, an arrogant smirk forming on her face. You, challenge me. This should be amusing. There's a low murmur of anticipation from the surrounding members. Some are eagerly waiting for the impending clash, while others seem apprehensive about the potential consequences. At this point, I lose all seriousness in my voice, put on as much fake confusion as I can and say, well, yeah, that's what I just said. The next part I address to Vespa. I assume there's some kind of arena or fighting pit, or do we just like throw down here? Vesper chuckles softly, clearly entertained by your audacity. While impromptu brawls have been known to happen here, for a formal challenge like this, we have the Ring of Resolve. It's a place where disputes can be settled without causing too much collateral damage. She stands up and gestures for you to follow. Come on. Let's not keep your eager audience waiting. The elven woman smirks, seemingly confident. Lead the way. The members of the lounge start to gather, some placing bets, others just eager to watch the showdown. As you make your way to the Ring of Resolve, you pass by other arenas. One arena contains a dwarven paladin fighting off a horde of zombies. Other contains two human warriors fighting a giant water serpent. And the last one you pass contains a centaur battling with fire elementals. Finally, you make it to an empty arena, and the stands fill up quickly. The anticipation in the air is palpable. The ring itself is an underground arena, lit by torches, and surrounded by elevated seating for spectators. The ground is sand-covered, ensuring a softer landing for those who might find themselves thrown around. Vesper leans over to you, as you step into the ring. Remember, it's not just about physical prowess, but also about reading your opponent and anticipating their moves. Good luck. With that, the elven woman steps forward, ready to engage. The fight is about to begin. I first want to summon Simon and Jaylee from the Amulet of Shadow Binding. Next, I would like to use my Summon Abyssal Minion ability granted to me by the Heart of the Abyss and summon a Quasit to my side. Finally, I would like to cast Mage Armor on myself, raising my AC to 14, and then bring forth my Shadow Blade of the Abyss and ready myself for battle. As the ambient magic in the room swells, you initiate a series of commands that have become second nature to you. The amulet glows momentarily, and from its depths emerge Simon and Jaylee, both in their newly enhanced shadow forms. Simon's intimidating size and Jaylee's agile form make for a contrasting and menacing pair. Following that, you reach deeper into the shadows around you, pulling forth a quasit. The small mischievous demon appears with a grin, already anticipating the havoc it can wreak. You then cast mage armor, feeling the protective magical field envelop you. With your AC now raised, you're even more of a formidable opponent. You draw forth the shadow blade of the abyss, its blackened blade gleaming menacingly in the torchlight. Across from you, the elven woman stands confidently, assessing you and your shadowy entourage. She doesn't seem phased by the odds, which speaks to her own abilities and experience. A horn sounds, signaling the start of the battle. Your heart rate accelerates in anticipation. The showdown has begun. I would like to try and hit her with my sword initially. Uh, I rolled a 12 on my attack. With a swift motion, you lunge forward, aiming your shadow blade of the abyss at the elven woman. The blade, dark as the night itself, swings through the air as you attempt to strike her. Your attack roll of 12 is met with her agile response. She manages to dodge your blade by a hair's breadth, her movements graceful and almost dance-like. She smirks at you, a look of amusement in her eyes. Is that all you've got? She teases, readying herself for a counter-attack. The battle has truly commenced, with both participants testing each other's strengths and abilities. I give her a smirk and duck out of the way of Simon's punch. What do I need to roll for his attack? Simon, being a shadowy construct with enhanced powers due to your recent augmentation, lunges at the elven woman with surprising speed. Given his improved state and unique abilities, you'll roll for his attack. For Simon's punch, roll a d20 and add his attack modifier. Given his enhanced state, let's give him a plus 4 attack bonus. Roll a d20 and add 4 to determine the outcome of Simon's surprise attack on the elven woman. I rolled a natural 20 on that one, so if Simon lands his shadowy swipe attack, what do I roll for the damage? A natural 20 is a critical hit. In typical D&D mechanics, a critical hit means you roll the damage dice twice and then add any modifiers. For Simon's shadow swipe attack, in his enhanced state, let's say he deals 2d6 damage. Since it's a critical hit, you'll roll 4d6 for the damage. There's no additional modifier for his damage, so the total of the 4 dice will be the damage dealt to the elven opponent. That's 19 damage, and it reduces the target's AC by 2 until the end of her next turn. Simon's shadowy form lashes out with incredible precision and power, landing a crushing blow across the elf's torso. As the shadow energy ripples across her body, you notice her movements becoming slightly more sluggish, her defenses weakened by the dark energies. The audience lets out a gasp, many impressed by the sheer power of Simon's attack, while others murmur with concern for the elf. She stumbles back, regaining her footing, her eyes narrowing in determination, though clearly impacted by the blow. Her AC is now reduced to 14, 
making her easier to hit for the upcoming round. You have some tricks up your sleeve. She hisses, gritting her teeth in pain. But this fight isn't over yet. It's now her turn to retaliate. The elf, clearly agitated by the unexpected strength of the attack, steadies herself and takes a deep breath. The air around her starts to crackle with arcane energy. With a swift motion of her hands and a murmured incantation, she casts a spell you recognize as Magic Missile. Three darts of pure magical energy shoot out towards Simon, since he seems to be the most immediate threat. Magic Missile always hits, and each dart deals 1d4 plus 1 force damage. Rolling for damage, first dart, 3 plus 1 equals 4 damage. Second dart, 2 plus 1 equals 3 damage. Third dart, 4 plus 1 equals 5 damage. Total damage to Simon, 12 points of force damage. The dart strikes Simon with unerring accuracy, causing him to reel from the impacts. Despite this, he remains on his feet, though visibly weakened by the assault. As the last dart fades, the elf smirks. Thought you had me, didn't you? The audience is clearly engrossed, with members of the Covenant shouting encouragements or jeers to both combatants. It's your move. As Simon falls back, Jaylee flies out from behind him, surprising the elf again, and attacks her with her whirlwind strike. What do I need to roll for that one? Or Jaylee's whirlwind strike, roll a d20, and add her attack bonus. Given Jaylee's enhanced form, she has a plus six attack bonus. Roll your d20, and add the six to see if her strike connects with the elf. That's a 17 to hit her. What do I roll for damage? A 17, especially with the reduced AC from Simon's earlier attack, should hit the elf. For the whirlwind strike of an enhanced Jaylee. Damage, 2d6 plus 4 slashing damage. That's 10 damage from Jaylee. How hurt is this elf? With the initial damage dealt by Simon 19, and now an additional 10 damage from Jaylee, you've inflicted a total of 29 damage on the elf. The elf, even though skilled in a seasoned fighter, is starting to show signs of fatigue. Her breaths are slightly heavier, and you can see a few cuts and bruises from the blows she's taken. Her movements are a tad slower, but she still holds a determined look in her eyes, indicating she's not completely out of the fight yet. The Quasit has the ability to turn invisible until it attacks. It turned invisible and has snuck up on the elf and goes to attack with its claws. Unfortunately, I only rolled a 6 on its attack roll, but I would like to use the distraction that it provided to use my sword's shatter step ability to dart in and attack her with the blade. I got a 17 with my attack. With the Quasit suddenly appearing out of its invisibility, the elf is momentarily distracted, even though the Quasit's claw attack misses her. Seizing this opportunity, you utilize your blade's shadow step ability to rapidly close the distance between you and the elf, appearing right next to her. Your blade sings through the air, and with a roll of 17, it manages to find its mark, striking the elf. Go ahead and roll for damage for your sword attack. Oh hell yeah, I rolled 9 damage, which is the most that this blade can do for now. Your blade slices deeply into the elf, causing her to wince and take a step back. The strike seems particularly potent, and it's clear that she's been significantly weakened by the series of attacks she's endured in this battle. Her confident demeanor from the start of the fight has faded, and she now looks more cautious and wary. You can tell she's now in a bad position, with a significant portion of her health depleted, but she's still standing, and her eyes are filled with determination. She's not one to give up easily. The crowd is going wild, some cheering for you and others for her. It's clear that everyone is enjoying the spectacle. The outcome of this fight is still uncertain, but you've managed to take control of the situation for now. <laughs> of course I have. Uh, whose turn is it? It's the elf's turn. Seeing that she's been heavily damaged and surrounded by foes, she recognizes the need for a strategic approach. With a swift motion, she begins to cast a spell, her hands moving quickly through the air, fingers tracing complex arcane patterns. Suddenly, a burst of blinding light emanates from her, filling the entire arena. Everyone, including you and your summoned creatures, is temporarily blinded by the intense illumination. As your vision returns, you see that she has used the opportunity to put some distance between herself and your team. She has also pulled out a potion from her belt and quickly drinks it. The cuts and bruises on her body begin to heal rapidly, restoring some of her vitality. The crowd is still roaring in excitement, but there are murmurs of surprise and admiration for her tactical maneuver. It's now your turn again. Oh, Abyss, no you don't! I want to cast Eldritch Blast. I rolled 14 on the attack. Your Eldritch Blast streaks through the air, fueled by the raw power of the Heart of the Abyss. The dark energy owns in on the elf. The 14 you rolled is enough to hit her, especially since she just consumed a potion and hasn't fully regained her defenses. Roll for damage. I rolled a 14 on the damage. After my exclamation, I draw power from my chest and pull the power of the heart to my right hand and shoot Eldritch Blast through the Shadow Blade of the Abyss, hitting the elf directly in the chest. With a powerful display of your newfound abilities, the Eldritch Blast, amplified by the Shadow Blade, strikes the elf squarely in the chest. The force is so strong that it knocks her off her feet and sends her crashing to the ground. The shadowy energy envelops her, and for a moment, the entire arena is silent. The shadow dissipates, revealing the elf unconscious on the ground, clearly defeated by your impressive attack. The crowd is stunned into a momentary silence before a mix of cheers and murmurs erupt. Some are clearly impressed with your abilities, while others whisper in hushed tones, likely noting the power of the heart of the abyss in your possession. 
Vesper steps into the arena, giving you a nod of respect. Well played Henry, she says, clapping you on the back. I think you've made your point. From the periphery of the arena, you notice the council members, including Tim, observing the outcome. While their expressions are difficult to read, it's clear that they've taken note of your capabilities. I dismiss the shadow blade of the abyss and jump a little while clapping and yell, That's how it's done, son! And the overt manly phrase is in contrast with the girly jumping and clapping that I'm doing. I then turn to Tim in particular and say, Oh my devil! Tim, did you see that? Did you see what I did? Have I made you proud, Shifu? Tim raises an eyebrow, clearly bemused by your display of exaggerated enthusiasm. The corner of his mouth twitches slightly, hinting at a suppressed smirk. You certainly have a way of making an impression, Henry. He remarks, maintaining his usually stoic demeanor, but with a hint of amusement in his voice. I can't deny your abilities, especially with that heart in your possession. Vesper, on the other hand, laughs openly. You never fail to entertain Henry, she says, shaking her head in amused disbelief. The surrounding crowd seems to be divided. Some are chuckling or rolling their eyes, finding your antics amusing or grating, while others whisper about the audacity you have, challenging the council's representative and then turning it into a spectacle. Whatever the reactions, it's clear you're the center of attention. And I didn't even need to bring out the big guy. And at those words, I use the power of the heart in combination with my minor illusion spell to conjure a giant shadowy demon that takes up the entire arena, with the intention of intimidating anyone else who still thinks they should challenge me. And I rolled a 23 on my intimidation check. The illusion of the colossal shadowy demon rises, its form almost touching the ceiling of the arena, with glowing red eyes and a deafening roar. The sight of it, combined with your recent display of power, sends a palpable wave of tension throughout the crowd. Many onlookers stumble back, a few shouting in surprise. Some of the younger or less experienced members of the Covenant show evident signs of fear, their eyes wide and their postures tense. Even a few seasoned veterans raise their eyebrows and exchange uneasy glances. Tim raises an eyebrow, clearly impressed but trying not to show it. You certainly know how to put on a show. Vesper gives you a sly smile, clearly entertained by the display. You really don't do things by half, do you Henry? The resounding message to anyone watching is clear. Challenging you would be a grave mistake. The atmosphere in the arena shifts from one of potential confrontation to a mix of awe and unease, with many now discussing your abilities in hushed tones. With my point now made, I would like to say to the illusion, Oh, who's a good demon of the lower planes? Not you. Oh no, you're not. You're evil. Now get the heck out of here. And I stop casting the illusion. I would then like to summon treats for Simon and Jaylee like I did before, giving them both a scratch behind the ears and saying, You do well in that fight. Oh yes, you did. Now sit. Paw. Oh, here you go. And then I give each of them a treat after performing their required tricks. I can't always give them treats for nothing after all. I turn to Vesper and say, So, you had my back in that fight, hey? I didn't see you in the ring. Vesper, leaning against the side of the arena, with a nonchalant posture, smirks and shrugs. Didn't look like you needed any help, but I was ready to jump in if things got dicey. She gives a wink. Besides, you have a flair for the dramatic. Didn't want to steal your spotlight. As the conversation continues, members of the Covenant start to disperse from the arena, some of them casting glances in your direction, their faces revealing a blend of respect, apprehension, and curiosity. The murmurs of your abilities, the demon illusion, and the might of your shadow familiar spread throughout the Covenant. Tim, keeping an observant eye on the whole situation, approaches you and Vesper. Henry, you've certainly made an impression today. Keep in mind, power attracts both allies and enemies. Tread carefully, he then adds, in a more jovial tone. But for now, enjoy your victory. And try not to turn the entire covenant upside down in one night. <laughs> I give him a big unexpected bear hug and say, Aw, you do care! Tim, momentarily stunned by the sudden embrace, stiffens up. After a few seconds, a slight chuckle escapes him, and he pats your back in an awkward manner. Well... Someone has to keep an eye on the troublemakers, he says, attempting to maintain his stoic composure as he gently pushes away from the hug. Vesper laughs, shaking her head. You really have a way of breaking down walls, don't you, Henry? Tim, straightening out his robes, gives you a half smirk. Just remember, not every wall needs to be broken. Some are there for a reason. He nods in acknowledgement and walks away, leaving you and Vesper in the aftermath of your grand spectacle. I give Tim a quick salute as he walks away and say, Thanks, boss man, you're the best. And I would like to turn to Vesper and say, well, that was fun. What do you want to do now? Vesper smirks, glancing around the room and noticing the hushed conversations and still present wide eyes from your spectacle. Well, after all that, a drink is in order, don't you think? Or maybe we could strategize about your next move. You've clearly established yourself here, but what's the next step for Henry, the tiefling who shattered the Covenant status quo? She takes a seat, gesturing for you to join her. Either way, I'm up for some company, and I suspect you have stories to tell. I say with an uncharacteristically serious tone. 
I assume you have somewhere private we can talk. Then go back to my normal tone. Oh, and yes, absolutely gonna have a drink. Do you have any apple juice at all? I say, trying to once again throw off everybody's expectations of Henry. Vesper raises an eyebrow, smirking. Apple juice. Of course. One never knows the drink of choice for the next rising power within the Covenant. She motions for a server, who scurries off to fulfill the request. She leans in closer, her voice low. For a private chat, I know just the place. Follow me. She leads you through a hidden door, down a dim corridor, and into a secluded chamber filled with plush seating and ornate decor. It's evident that this is a place for confidential matters, as a warding sigil glows faintly on one wall, ensuring no eavesdropping. Once inside, Vesper turns to you, her demeanor more serious. All right, Henry, we're alone. What's on your mind? Can you keep a secret? Vesper raises an eyebrow, her expression inscrutable. In our line of work, secrets are currency. What do you have to share, Henry? Well, that doesn't really put my mind at ease that she won't eventually betray any secrets without intervention. And during this entire conversation, I want to use the amulet of mind control to reinforce that this should not be spoken of with anyone other than me in private. I got the heart of the abyss. At this, I open my shirt and show her the intricate pattern it left on my chest when we attuned to each other. Vesper's eyes widen in surprise and curiosity, drawn to the dark swirling pattern on your chest. By the abyss. That's, I've only heard legends. I never thought it was real, let alone that someone would actually possess it. She takes a deep breath, clearly processing the gravity of the situation. Henry, do you realize what you have? And more importantly, do you realize the danger you're in? The Obsidian Covenant isn't the only faction that desires such power. She sips her drink thoughtfully, maintaining eye contact. What do you plan to do with it? At this I shrug and say, I don't know, I gave myself an... Obviously, my minion's a bit of a power-up, but I figured since the leader of this organization is a master of shadow magic, I might just get some of my own. The amulet of shadow binding that he just gave me on entry is a clear indication that the boss is powerful if he's just giving this away. So if shadow magic can make someone strong enough that these amulets are nothing, it's obviously a good path to walk. I'm telling you this now since you seem to be the one handling me, and I want to go on more missions to get more shadow magic, or to connect more with the heart. I've only tapped into the basic power it can offer. I know you know more than what you're telling me. I want to learn as much as I can about it. I want to deepen my connection with it. I assume there are dangerous places in the world that would allow me to do just that. Vesper sighs, setting her glass on the table. The Heart of the Abyss is an artifact of immense power, but its power is not unrestricted. Just as it can grant you incredible abilities, it can also be a beacon for those seeking its power. The Heart itself is mysterious, its origins are debated and its full potential is unknown. But you're right about one thing. If you wish to tap into its deeper power and further understand it, you will need to venture to places of darkness, places infused with the essence of the Abyss. Such locations can help you unlock more of its capabilities, but remember, it's not just about acquiring power, but also understanding and controlling it. There are locations, temples, and ancient ruins that may hold the secrets you seek. But they are treacherous, guarded not only by creatures of the abyss but also by those who wish to claim the heart for themselves. If you're serious about this, I can help guide you. But you need to be prepared for the challenges ahead. As for the shadow magic, training and practice will be essential. The leader of our covenant might be willing to teach you, but you'll need to earn that privilege. I'm not afraid of people trying to take the heart. The ritual I performed has connected us, fused us. The heart is as much part of me now as my own heart is. And it's hard to describe, but I don't think it's physical anymore. I think it's more magically fused with my entire being. At this point, I do take a drink to center myself. I think I would like to deepen the connection before I start training with the leader. I need to have more control before I show anyone else the true extent of my current capabilities. If no one knows exactly what I can do, I can continue slipping things by their perceptions. Vesper nods thoughtfully. I understand your sentiment. Keeping some cards close to your chest is a wise move, especially in an organization as complex and shadowy as ours. The true power of the heart should be your secret, and using it wisely will give you an advantage. She seems contemplative for a moment. I know of a place that might help deepen your connection with the heart. It's called the Abyssal Nexus. It's a convergence of ley lines infused with the energy of the abyss. It's said that time spent meditating there can strengthen one's bond with abyssal energies. However, it's not easy to find and even harder to reach. The Nexus moves, shifts, like a shadow in the night. But with the right guidance, we might be able to locate it. Just be warned, it's not a journey to be taken lightly. If you're serious about this, we can start making preparations. But remember, this is a personal journey. The Covenant will support you, but the connection you seek, the growth you desire, that's all on you. Oh, I'm serious about this. But no need to hurry with the preparations. I'm sure we can take one night to sleep and relax before starting. I would then like to continue having some drinks, relaxing and chatting with Evelyn before heading off to bed. The night continues on pleasantly. Gesper shares stories from her past and missions she has taken on behalf of the Covenant. Some are chilling tales of treachery and danger, while others are more lighthearted, even humorous. 
it becomes clear that, while she is a fierce and dedicated member of the Covenant, she also has a depth of personality and warmth that you hadn't previously seen. As the hours wane and the effects of the drink start to settle in, you find yourself feeling more relaxed and at ease than you have in a long time. The ambiance of the lounge, the soft murmur of conversations around, and the feeling of having a confidant in this shadowy world contribute to your comfort. Eventually, the night draws to a close, and you decide it's time to head to bed. Vesper gives you a knowing nod. Rest well, Henry. Tomorrow we start a new chapter in your journey. You retire to your quarters, the weight of the day's events pressing down on you, but also a spark of excitement for what's to come. The journey ahead promises danger, discovery, and a deeper understanding of the abyssal power, now intertwined with your very being. As I'm getting ready for bed, I would like to summon Simon and Jaylee like normal with the instructions to watch over the room while asleep, and to wake me immediately at the first sign of danger. As you call upon the amulet of shadow binding, the familiar wisps of shadow rise and swirl around the room, solidifying into the forms of Simon and Jaylee. Simon, with his humanoid appearance and glowing eyes, nods to acknowledge your instructions, while Jaylee, in her more ethereal bat-like form, flutters around for a moment before settling atop a nearby shelf, her keen eyes scanning the room. With the two of them on guard, you can't help but feel an added layer of security. Their presence, combined with the weight of the day's events, soon lulls you into a deep, restful sleep. The shadows of your room acting as protectors in the stillness of the night. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I won't be doing the AI goose because the AI was thirsty this time. Seriously, anytime it wasn't one of the pictures that I actually chose, the characters were mostly naked. And I don't know why, I was very specific with how I worded the request, making sure to describe the clothing that everyone was wearing. And I know that AI has a bias towards making women mostly naked since that's how they're often shown in fantasy stuff, but seriously, Henry and Tim were not excluded. I am trying my best to keep everyone clothed and have this just be appropriate, but there is a serious issue here with the AIs. But we did get a couple of cool photos of Simon and Jaylee, so that's at least something. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed, and if not, let me know what I can do to make it better. Okay, bye.